We are back after an extended break. It's been a while since we've been uh, in the Gospel of Matthew. Um, if you need to get caught up, then you can go back and you can go back through the first uh, three, almost four chapters that uh, we have covered. Um, the last time that we met, um, we saw the, the call of the disciples. And we saw that the disciples, and specifically Peter and John, that they had actually had other encounters with Jesus before, before they accepted the call. And the one thing that I want to draw out on that tonight is the fact that many of us in this room are praying for loved ones, for friends, that they would come into this life-giving relationship with Jesus and we can't grow weary in, in our prayer. We can't grow weary in our labor of love, of bringing them to the throne room and, and asking the Holy Spirit to move on their hearts. We know that without the Holy Spirit, it is impossible to have a relationship with Jesus. But we know that prayer is powerful. We know that prayer moves God's heart just like it moves our heart. And God can move on the heart of that person who just keeps having Jesus encounters but is not coming into that relationship with them. So we need to be persistent in what we're doing. Um, tonight we're going to look at Jesus' ministry. We're just going to take the last couple of verses of chapter 4. But these verses, they encompass Jesus' ministry in the Gospels. And so this is what Jesus did. This is what he was about just this was Jesus's mission. And so we're going to open with Matthew chapter 4 and we're going to start in verse 23. So if you've got your Bible or your tablet or whatever, you can open it up. We'll have verses on the wall for you. And this is what it reads. And he went throughout Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis, and from Jerusalem and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. So, Father, as we wrap up this chapter tonight, God, I just pray that um, we would see uh, just the goodness of Christ's ministry, the impact of that ministry on that area, and the impact on his ministry even today uh, with us here. Father, uh, bless us with your presence. Holy Spirit, teach us, and we thank you in Jesus' name. And all the church said... So Matthew tells us here that Jesus was going throughout Galilee and he was teaching in the synagogues and he was proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. Now, Matthew uses two terms here. He says teaching and proclaiming the gospel. What is the difference between the two? Is there a difference between teaching and proclaiming? Well, I think William Barclay kind of sums things up the best. He says, preaching is the uncompromising proclamation of certainties. Teaching is the explanation of the meaning and the significance of them. So we proclaim the certainties of Christ. We proclaim the certainties of the gospel. And the teaching part is where we break down what those certainties mean and the significance of those things in our lives. Now, there's a lot of people in the church today that think that expository teaching is the only way that we can possibly meet and come together and, and, and study the Word of God. And again, expository teaching is great. I love expository teaching. I love going verse by verse. But Jesus shows us here in these verses that both preaching and teaching are essential. For instance, you don't teach salvation. You proclaim or you preach salvation. You preach Christ crucified. It's not something you teach. It's something that's proclaimed. 
is something that's brought forth that people hear. When they hear, then they respond and receive. You don't teach the goodness of God. You proclaim the goodness of God. Once somebody comes into a relationship with Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, then we're able to break down what salvation means to us as believers or what the goodness of God means to us as believers. Both are necessary in the body of Christ, church. But the problem is that we have a lot of people that love the expository teaching because they get a whole bunch of knowledge. And that's great. Knowledge is great. But the problem is, is a lot of us today do not know how to apply the knowledge that we have. Church, knowledge is useless if there is no way to apply it. It doesn't matter how much you know if you can't apply it in your life. If you can't take what you know and apply it in your life and go to somebody who's in need, somebody who needs the message of the gospel, if you don't have the ability to apply it and share it, what good is your knowledge? It's no good. Church, our number one job is to proclaim and preach the gospel of Jesus. That's job number one. Not to be teachers, right? To be proclaimers. Jesus told us to go and tell. First you tell, then we make. The making of disciples is the teaching part, but the telling, the proclaiming is what brings people in. So a balanced ministry will do both, and that's what we try to do here at The Refuge. We try to be balanced. We try to do expository teaching, and then we also have teaching where on Sundays right now we're going through different types of series where we're taking the Word of God and we're helping you apply it in your life, right? Because if we walk out of here and we can't take what we've heard and apply it, then our time was useless. Now, Matthew also tells us that Jesus heals every disease and affliction. Interesting that that Matthew brings this out because here Jesus is actually following a pattern that we find in the Torah. So those those Jews who are are being uh, um, ministered to by Christ, who's who's doing these these things, they're going to understand that this is a picture of something that's happened before in the past. If you think about it, Any of you who have read the Bible, who have studied the Bible, who have looked at the Old Testament, prophets typically worked in different supernatural ways. Not all of them had the same gifts, but they all had the same message. They all had the same mission. What was that? It was to be a spokesperson for God. And this is what Jesus was doing. He was being a spokesperson and through the supernatural things that he was doing, he was also validating the fact that he was somebody that was sent from God. Now, Jesus' message is clear. He says, repent, for the kingdom of God is near. He uses the same exact terminology as John the Baptist did, except now the, the one, the Messiah, is actually the one proclaiming this repentance. So when he says, repent, for the kingdom of God is near, What he's telling people is get back to God, turn, turn back to God, turn back from what you are doing, right? And get back, get right with God. This is Jesus's message to the multitudes. Now, Matthew also says something interesting in these verses. He says that his fame grew, his fame grew. Now, fame, what is, what is Matthew saying here? This word fame is not the word we use in the same sense today. When we hear fame, we think of famous or, or you know, superstar, or there's a famous person, or, or they're fame, they're, they're, they're known because they, they've done some, you know, uh, they've given billions of dollars, whatever it is, okay? When we hear the word fame, it's not used in the same way as Matthew's using here. The word that Matthew is using in the Greek is a word called akoye. Okay, and it means instruction, hearsay, report, or rumor. So in other words, when Matthew uses the word fame, right, he's, he's 
saying that the report on Jesus grew. His, his, the hearsay on Jesus grew. The, the report on Jesus grew, okay? And so more and, poor, more and more people were reporting what Jesus was saying and doing, right? His instruction to the people, the miraculous signs that he was doing, the, the supernatural things, okay? This is what's being reported. This is the fame, not so much the man, but what is reported about the man. Listen, Jesus is not moved by fame in the sense that we are. We get moved by it. I know people that want to position themselves all the, way, all the time. Like, I'll never forget this. When I was in the car business, me and my boys, we were working at a, at a, a car business here in Fairfield, right? And this famous rapper comes down from, from Vallejo. Now, I used to tell my guys all the time that worked for me on the sales floor, I said, I don't care who comes in, you treat everybody equally. Don't get starstruck, don't nothing, you just treat everybody equally. Well, the guys that ran the, the dealership that I worked for, you'd have thought they were teenage boys seeing the, 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 their idol coming in. They freaked out, right? Taking selfies, videos, posting them on, on Facebook and everything. And I'm thinking, he's just a man. He's just a man. Listen, when we get starstruck over people, we should be starstruck over Jesus. That's who we need to be starstruck over, man. I will always remember that thinking, my gosh, right? And, and, you, know who got, and you know who got the car sales that day. It wasn't none of them fools. It was us. He was, this guy was like, man, I need to be around somebody that's not acting like a fool. And we're, me and we're just off kicking it like this, watching everybody. Pretty soon we move in and we, we sell them two, you know, fully revved up Camaros, you know. I mean, I mean, yeah, listen, we should not be moved by fame, people. We should be moved by Christ. Jesus was moved by God. He wasn't moved by what the people were doing. He wasn't moved by what the people were saying because people will change on you in a minute. Every one of us know that. It's no joke. Now, verse 24 says something. It says, They brought him all the sick and those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. Now, church, this is a very impressive list. It says that they brought all, not some, but they brought all the sick, all those afflicted. And Matthew is showing us this list that Jesus heals. And, and if you think about it, every aspect of life is captured here in these various diseases and pains and things that are being described, right? Now, the word for sick and afflicted, it's, it's, a, it's a term this word is called seniko in the Greek, and it means to hold or, constri or constrain or to be suffering from. So this is the, everything that's being described here was what had a hold on them and caused them suffering. It had a grip on them. And, and listen, Jesus is the one who can pry us away from those things that have a grip on our lives. Jesus is the one who breaks the chains. Jesus is the one who removes these things from us. It says that Jesus had the ability to uh, uh, heal those who had various diseases, right? If you had cancer, gone. Leprosy, gone. Diabetes, gone. I got irritable syndrome, gone, right? You know? I mean, I'm telling you, Jesus had the ability to do that. What are we talking about? These, in, these internal things that, that were inflicting the body. It says pains. Listen, some of you might be dealing with back pain tonight, migraines. You might be dealing with heartache tonight. Man, Jesus, he dealt with that. He cleansed them. He healed them of those things. Demonic oppression, man. I know a lot of people don't want to believe that demonic stuff is true. It's real. I'm telling you, it's real. And Jesus here is, he's healing people of demonic oppression. Demonic oppression is behind a lot of things that happen to us physically, church. 
Demons have a way of attacking our bodies. It says here that he healed them of seizures. Seizures. People that are, that are, I mean, if you've never been around somebody that has a seizure, it's scary. It's very, very scary. Paralytics, man, people that couldn't move their limbs, right? People that were immobile. He healed them. He healed them, church. Why? Because he's a compassionate, compassionate Savior. And isn't it wonderful to know that we have a Savior that heals that we have a sa- Savior that has compassion for us and a compassion that is overwhelming, church. Jesus desires for us to be free. Now, some of you are saying, well, great. So here in Matthew verse 24, uh, 4, 24, we see Jesus doing all this wonderful thing, healing everybody of all this stuff. How come, we, how come I'm not healed today? How come I'm still going through what I'm going through? Well, I don't have an answer to that, church. I don't know why you're going through what you're going through. But I have an idea of why a lot of times we don't see God heal and do the miraculous that we've seen in the past or in Scripture. And it's because we don't rely on God like we need to. We rely more on doctors and things like that today than we do God, right? I remember a pastor telling me one time, he said that he had a, he had a, terrible, a terrible headache. And he said he went to go reach for the Tylenol because that's what he does, and that's what I do when I have a headache. I reach for the Tylenol, right? But he says he just felt something in his spirit, said, why don't you ask me to remove it? Why don't you just ask me? Why don't you start with me first? And so... He prayed and said a simple prayer, Lord, if this is really your voice, then take the headache away. And it was gone. Now, I'm not saying the Tylenol wasn't a bad idea. Like I said, I use Tylenol. But the point is, is that we go to God last. Or we go to God when we get the bad report. But when the onset of things comes, we need to start with God. I was at a pastor's conference one time, and some of you have heard this story, but this pastor was sharing uh, this, the, the story of miracles. And we're going to talk about miracles in two weeks, um, uh, and I'm going to get into, the, into it more in depth in two weeks. But he was talking about why we don't see them more today. Why don't we see the miraculous? How come we don't see the things that we saw in the Bible? Now, this was a pastor that I knew and I respected. He wasn't some, you know, whacked out dude. This dude was solid as a rock very midstream on everything, but he was talking about miracles. And he shared about a time when he went down to Columbia to a church plant that they had done, and he was hearing about this woman who had the ability to do these miraculous healings. And he was like, man, Lord, I would love to go and meet with this woman. I'm just, I'm intrigued, God. Why? I mean, we're talking like limbs restored, you know, people that were paralyzed being able to walk, just supernatural, miraculous things like that. So he gets there. First off, when he gets there, she's living in a very small hut type home. No electricity, no running water, right? None of the amenities that we have. And he said when he walked in, He said the presence of God was so strong in this small, tiny little hut, it was overwhelming and overpowering. And so he sat there, and through an interpreter, he was asking her all these kinds of questions, and he was just curious about her life and and how she encountered Jesus and so on and so forth. And so being from that region, she had come up in a religious system, and, and then she had encountered Jesus in a real and relative way through a missionary, and she fell in love with reading the Word of God, and then she realized that God had a supernatural grace and power that He wanted to instill in her. And people would come to her, and she would just pray. She would just pray over them. And stuff would happen. Miraculous stuff. And people would line up outside her little hut, just to have her pray over them. He was amazed at what he saw. 
And he was flying back home, and he was thinking, God, how come we don't see this in our church? We have 15,000 people that come to our church every weekend. We never see the miraculous like this. We never encounter the miraculous like this. And God said, because there's nothing between her and me. Nothing. She has no distractions. She has nothing between her and me. I am her everything. And I think a lot of times, church, we don't see what we want to see in our lives because we have things between us and God. We walk the talk and or talk the talk and walk the walk, right? We're very good with Christianese. I know I'm good at it. I know you guys are good at it, right? We know how to say things and we know how to do things. But we have barriers between us. And so we don't see the miraculous like we should see because First off, we don't believe in the God of the miraculous. We only believe this much, and that's it. She was all in. Fast forward a couple of Sundays later, and he's bearing this in mind. No barriers between me and God. No barriers between God. No, perceived, no preconceived notions between me and God about anything. And, I, I, and you guys know this story. And so this dude gets wheeled up in a wheelchair right? Gets wheeled up in a wheelchair. The family comes up and says, Pastor, can, can you pray for our father? And so the pastor says, sure. And in his spirit, he hears the words of, of Peter to the paralytic. He says, in Jesus' name, rise up and walk. And he grabs his hand and he pulls him up out of the wheelchair, right? And the family starts crying and weeping. They can't believe it. They're screaming, hallelujah, hallelujah. And then when things got settled down, the the, the, uh, daughter, I think it was, looks at him and says, how did you know to do that? We were just bringing him up for you so you could pray over him because he had the flu. He had the flu. They brought him up to get prayed over because he had the flu. But God said, no, I'm going to raise him up out of this wheelchair because that's what I want him to be is free from that, not free from the flu. That's the miraculous church. Those are the things that I desire to see happening. Those are the things that we used to see early in our ministry. Some of you guys remember that stuff. We saw miraculous things, miraculous healings. We saw instantaneous things happen. God is still in the miracle business, church. He's still in the miracle business. And as I said, in a couple weeks, we're going to talk more about the miracles. Last thing as I wrap up here. I don't have much today. Verse 25 says, And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. It says these great crowds followed him. Now, Galilee is a region... The Decapolis was made up of 10 cities in that region, 10 small cities. And then you had Jerusalem and Judea, right? Okay, so you had this area. Here's what you need to understand. This is the scope of the ministry of Jesus. He never travels outside of these areas, never travels outside of them. He worked in a very small, distinct area. It wasn't like he was traveling up and down the, 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 the nation of Israel. He was in a very small, distinct area. Listen, here's what I want you to catch from this tonight, church. God gives us specific areas to work. He gives us specific areas. But too many times, we're looking outside of what he gives us because we think it's not big enough. Well, I need to have more influence. I need to have more power. I have to need more leadership or whatever it is. But if we would just focus on what God gives us to do, then we will have amazing results. Jesus was not, um, he was not looking to expand his, his area of influence, right? In the sense of, of getting farther out from where he was at. Rather, he wanted to have impact on where he was at. In church, that's what we need to learn. Whatever area of responsibility you have, just try focusing on that and being faithful to that. Stop skipping stuff, right? You can't be faithful if you're not here. 
well, I don't feel like coming. Well, then you're not called. I don't feel like coming sometimes. But I come because I know there's a blessing in it. Right? We do what others don't do so we can be successful. Jesus knew where he was supposed to be. Right? He knew his area of influence. And his area of influence was the house of Israel. It was in that area where the influence of Judaism was at its strongest. That was his ministry. He even reminds the Gentile woman of this. Remember when she says, hey, heal my, heal my daughter. And he says, man, you know, even the, you know, the, she says, even the dogs eat the crumbs off of the, off of the master's table. And he says, huh, well, great faith. We'll get into that in a few weeks too. But my point is he tells the Gentile lady that, man, you're not my focus right now. Church, be faithful to what God has called you to do. Stop looking for more. More will come when you're faithful to what God has given you. That's God's economy. Be faithful in the little, and he will give you more. But if you can't be faithful in the little, he will not give you more influence. Now, one last thing I'm going to tell you. It says, and great crowds followed him. I don't want you to misread this. Great crowds did follow Jesus, but that does not mean that they believed in him. That doesn't mean they believed in him. Now, they were nonetheless amazed at what Jesus is doing. I mean, they're like, wow, look at this guy. I don't care who you bring to him. He is healing him. And his message seems pretty legit, man. Repent for the kingdom of God is is, is near. I mean, that's a pretty legit message. But here's what you need to understand. They followed him in the beginning because they wanted to see the show. They just wanted to see the show. And it's the same way in the church today. I mean, I'm telling you right now, many people follow Jesus because of what he's doing. They want to watch and be a part of the show. That's what they want. They want to, they want to feel like they're a part of it. But they really never believe in the person of Jesus. And they never really come into a real and relative relationship with him. They're the ones who say, oh, I know him. You know those people that are name droppers? They're always going to drop the name of somebody they know. Oh, I know that person. Or I hung out with that person. Or I was this person. I was that person, man. And they're just, they're just doing it to impress others. Well, this was what was happening in the beginning with Jesus. These people were following him, but they were following the show. Now, Jesus will indeed, church, have many followers as his ministry goes further along. We're going to see Jesus get more and more momentum with the people. We're going to see more and more of those who are going to come and commit their lives to him. But in doing so, those very same people are going to be put to the test. And their relationship with him will be put through the fire. And church, that's the reality of us today. If, you're, if you haven't put, been put through the test with Jesus, if you haven't been put through the fire with your relationship with Jesus, then I wonder if you really belong to Jesus. Because trust me, if you belong to him, then you're going to go through the fire with him. And you're going to rely on him in ways that you never thought were possible. Church, we need to be careful not to be part of the great followers who just tag along for the show, right? A lot of people come to church for the show. They come to church for the show. Man, they come to church because they're going to get the lights and the music, and they're going to get this, and they're going to get that, and they're going to feel good, and they're going to get a real good feel-good message. They're going to walk out of there, but at no moment were they closer to Jesus than when they walked in. We're, we're not here for entertainment purposes, church. Jesus wasn't on this earth for entertainment purposes. Nothing he did was to entertain the people. Everything he did was to impact them and show them that there was a loving God who desired to be in a relationship with them, who wanted to pour his mercy and grace on them, and that he was the fleshly living example of what that God looks like and does. Church, That was Jesus' ministry. 
And that's what we're going to be looking at now through the rest of the Gospel of Matthew. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, thank you. And we thank you for your word and the fact that, Jesus, man, you weren't moved by nobody but God. You were moved by what your mission was. You were moved by the will of your Father. And you and the Father were one. And so, Lord, thank you. Thank you for this um, excerpt that gave us a glimpse of what we are going to see now in the rest of the book of Matthew. And all these things are going to lead to that moment when you not only die on the cross, but when you beat death, when you're resurrected from the grave and offer eternal life to all who love you. Thank you, Lord. We praise you in Jesus' name and all the saints said. Amen. Amen.